Good evening participants and attendees myself first and on behalf of cyber for all community i welcome you all before we start today's session i would like to share brief details regarding cyber for all community cyber for all is a cyber security concerned community focusing and marching towards creation of a safe and secure cyber space era our mission is to keep the community up to date with all around happenings in the cyber world within cyber for all there are so many cyber experts professionals and independent security analysts who are actively engaged within our community and their primary goal is focusing on cyber security cyber crime and major data breaches and hacks they also cover daily cyber security news hacking news technology updates and various security and ethical hacking tutorials our team of experts and security enthusiasts provides regular security awareness and training solutions to everyone who wants to improve their security and awareness in today's digital world cyber for all organizes various events and activities within its community which involves regular up to date cyber security blogs talks and presentations within weekly church and webinar series along with many hands on workshops and webinars cyber awareness activities and many more talking about this month's first webinar the topic for webinar is hacking modern web apps with rce and prototype pollution and our speaker for webinar is abraham talking about him he has more than 13 years of experience in it security and currently he is ceo and directing manager of 7 a security which is a company specializing in pen testing of testing of web applications mobile applications infrastructure code reviews and training he has been also security trainer at black hat usa hitb ovas global appsec and many other events along with so many other achievements which keeps going on i am sure we all are going to enjoy today's talk with b and will be having great opportunity to gain and improve our cyber security skills and knowledge so without any further delay i would like to call our today's speaker abraham you can start the webinar over to you abraham awesome thank you uh, yeah so welcome to this session about hacking modern web apps with uh, remote code execution and prototype pollution so we are going to do first a quick course introduction because this webinar is part of a, our web course. So I'll just give you a five minute overview of how that looks like and then we will jump into uh, these topics, right? So this webinar is also a workshop. So I will be giving you, um, I have already sent you an access to um, all the, to the training portal. So if somebody is watching this on YouTube, you just email uh, admin at 70security.com we can give you access to this as well so when i do the demos uh from the training portal you just click on the on the vulnerable application that uh, where we will do the exercise uh and then to just uh, as you're logged into the training portal just click from the slides and then you will be able to download those applications and then try on your own everything that i'm going to explain today so it's also a workshop right so today because we only have around one hour um i will just jump into the demos myself but uh you can then try these exercises on your own since you have access to all these uh, vulnerable applications uh, to practice on your own so uh, i'll do a brief uh, course introduction and then we will talk about uh, remote code execution options against node.js applications so in the case where you have some uh, code execution vulnerability what can you do with it uh, in node.js and then we will talk about uh, prototype pollution uh, and we will also talk about um, a cross-site request forgery case study in a vulnerable application. Um, and all this is uh, like some, they are all like snippets from parts of the course, right? So these are some of the things that we cover. Um, so I think this was uh, more or less said in the introduction, so no point in uh, talking too much about it. But I'm the CEO of 70 Security. If you like this presentation on the website, you can also see a lot of public pen test reports. So if you go to publications, there's a lot of public pen test reports, so you can read all of those for free. And that's a very good um, way to learn about security, to read, uh, you know, what has been found in, in other applications. 
uh, upcoming training and training options, you can check the training link. I also wrote, uh, wrote a course for uh, eLearn Security a while back. We have delivered training at Black Hat USA, Hacking the Boss, uh, OWASP Global AppSec, Nullcon, and many others. All the presentations you can see here and some uh, certifications. If we meet someday, I can explain to you how this happened. Um, and yeah, some uh, public contents report um, here. This got a, a bit of uh, media attention because um, Smart Sheriff was an application that was mandated in the entire country of South Korea. So children and parents were forced by law to install this application so that the parent would be able to uh, do parenting of the child, right? To uh, control like during what times the child would be able to use the phone, uh, what websites uh, the child uh, should be able to access during what hours uh, and what kind of, what applications should the child um, have access to, right? So all these things uh, were controlled by the application. So in theory, a nice idea to uh, keep children safe on the internet. Uh, in practice, uh, the implementation was really bad. So. In these two pen test reports, you can see everything you should never do uh, in an application. So you can you can see that in this report. So it was so bad that we even gave a presentation about it. So you can watch it for free as well on on YouTube. And this, the slides are here. And these, uh, if you go, if you search in YouTube uh, Chinese police and cloud pets, you will see another presentation that I gave, uh, and that covers uh, some uh, IoT devices. Um, that were like pets for uh, children to talk to the parents and then uh, some applications that the Chinese government uses to collect information specifically on uh, people like Muslims in a region called Xinjiang in China, right? So we were basically trying to help uh, human rights activists to answer the question, uh, are these, uh, is this information that the Chinese government is gathering is it a human right violation or not, right? So that was up for the human rights activists to decide, and we just helped them on the technical side. So you can read about that uh, in these, uh, on the website. You can see these reports as well as a link to the YouTube presentation as well. And many other reports on the website, right? So take those. Now this uh, particular course has been also written by Anirudh Anand. So he's a security researcher. Um, he likes to play CTF, so he's a member of the number one ranked team in India, Team BIOS, uh, for CTFs. He has found vulnerabilities in Google, Microsoft, LinkedIn, GitLab, and others. Uh, contributed to some open source projects like OWTF, uh, Academic, and others. Some certifications, this is his blog and his Twitter. Um, and then for the course itself, uh, you basically need... Um, you basically need some some basis, right? So you need to be able to connect to uh, wireless and wired networks, ability to read PDF files. Now, a lot of people sometimes come with corporate laptops and they basically cannot do anything. And that is, uh, of course, not good <laughs> because you need to at least be able to uh, import uh, a, a VM that we will share uh, and so on, right? So that is for, for the course itself. So, you know, you need uh, to be able at least to import a VM, right? Uh, 8 gigabytes of RAM should be enough. And if you have 16 or more, that's even better. Uh, 60 gigabytes of free, 3D space uh, will be excellent um, to be able to import a VM and other stuff that we will share. And then in this particular course, uh, the VM that we will share is for VirtualBox, but if you use VMware, that is also known uh, to work. And for money in the middle stuff, we will be using uh, Burp. Uh, for the course, uh, the first four points are kind of uh, normal, right? So digital copies of all training material, lab VMs, test, app, uh, test, test apps, and source code of, for the test application. So this is kind of normal. And then something that we do that is uh, a little less uh, usual uh, is that we give you lifetime access to the training portal, including all future updates for free, right? So a lot of companies will charge you whenever the course is updated. And if you want the update, you have to pay again. So uh, we give you all updates for free, and then you get also step-by-step -step video recordings, the slide, the slides, and the lab PDFs, and you also get unlimited email support, right? Because nobody has uh, enough time to finish all the labs during the class, so you can then keep trying them on your own and ask us if you have any questions. <clears throat> So uh, in the course itself, uh, the first part is starts with uh, hacking modern web apps, mastering the future of attack vector. So we, we do a brief uh, setup check and an introduction to Node.js. 
So we talk about the Node.js app structure, uh, vulnerabilities and dependencies. Uh, we will do um, a bit of this today. Uh, vulnerabilities in source code, right? How to uh, do some uh, co static code analysis using Node.js scans to find some vulnerabilities and then some basics about how to secure uh, Node applications. Then in lab two, we talk about inject injection attacks on Node.js, so SQL injection, NoSQL injection, some CDs. So we do a lot of case studies about real applications, um, some vulnerabilities that are public. So we will be installing these vulnerable applications to practice. So server-side template injection, uh, CRAS CMS, uh, server-side template injection, things like this. In lab three, we talk about client-side attacks on Node.js. So uh, we talk about content security policy, bypassing content security policy with JSONP endpoints, um, markdown-based XSS, uh, Windows post message, um, some case studies uh, for with known uh, CVEs, uh, quite recent. So 2020 is a CVEs from this year. Um, we talk. We also have some course I request forgery examples, and today we will do uh, this one, uh, the Vault uh, Vault CMS course I request forgery from XSS to uh, remote code execution. Uh, also, we will be doing um, introduction to open redirect vulnerabilities and click jacking. Then in Lab Four, we talk about business logic flow, so insecure direct object references, bypassing and computing captcha, um, privilege collation with uh, in Express Card, right? So lots of case studies from real applications. Uh, another privilege collation by uh, through an attack takeover, right? Then uh, in Lab Five, attacking NPM modules. This is uh, uh, because when you have a, a web application, uh, the web application in Node.js is typically very small. But if you take into account all the dependencies that the application uses, then there's really a lot of uh, code that the application is using. So in this lab, we talk about a lot of uh, vulnerabilities uh, that you could have inherited from uh, dependencies, right? And these are all publicly known vulnerabilities. So lots of interesting things, a directory traversal, arbitrary file write, a remote code execution, regular expression denial of service, uh, an arbitrary code injection of some of the scenarios uh, in labs. Six cryptography, we talk about uh, attacking coupons, attacking JWT tokens, uh, and express and uh, Laravel uh, passport authentication bypass. This day finishes with a CTF, so there's some open challenges for you, kind of to try harder, right? So these are not like spoon feeding you, they are more kind of meant to, after you complete all the other labs, you can really test uh, all your skills uh, on this one, on these open challenges. And then in part two, we talk about prototype pollution attacks, so we will be talking a little bit about this today. So we will be talking about uh, objects in JavaScript, functions, classes, constructors, prototypes, and all this. Uh, and then in prototype pollution, um, how this uh, works. So we, I will be talking about this today. So object recursive merge, and then how uh, why was merge vulnerable, as well as some uh, case studies, right? So exploiting prototype pollution in Express file upload. So this was an actual issue also from 2020. Uh, and then in lab two, uh, we talk about top uh, vulnerability classes, right? So this is the second day of the web training. And you can see here that some uh, comparisons here, we have like some special cases where sometimes when a developer is making a comparison, uh, you know, there can be some edge cases where the comparison doesn't actually work the way the developer thought. So this could result in, in some problem, right? So a lot of uh, things that we talk about here, type juggling in PHP uh, and then in Python with uh, Ampicle, uh, and then there's also node serialized with uh, unserialization and getting remote code execution in Node.js through uh, node, node serialized, right? So lots of scenarios like this, and then in Lab3 auth applications, so we talk about uh, some uh, vulnerabilities related to auth, right? So this is very a very important topic because a lot of applications now tell you to log in with Google, log in with Facebook, and if the implementation of these uh, auth uh, is not correct, there can be a lot of issues. So we uh, walk you through all those on that. Then lab for file upload vulnerability. So again, lots of case studies here, uploading uh, SVG images, uh, case studies for uh, real apps uh, and so on about uh, file uploads, and then in lab five, attacking file parsers, server-side request forgery, uh, again, many case studies, arbitrary file read, arbitrary file read by attachments, 
lots of uh, interesting things. And then there's also uh, another TTF to test your skills, right? So that's what the course is about. And now we're going to start with the actual uh, webinar content about uh, remote code execution options against Node.js applications. Right, so to do this exercise that I'm going to, uh, because as I said, this is a workshop as well. So uh, you log into the training portal and then uh, you click on the slides. So there's a button called uh, download slides or something like this. So you just click on this and then when you open the slides and you are on this slide, uh, as you are logged into the training portal, just click on this and then you will be able to download this vulnerable application and then locally uh, on your computer, you can try uh, to exploit this thing that I'm going to explain, right? So this is um, um, this is just for you to, to practice and, and gain uh, hacking experience while <clears throat> you try to replicate what I'm going to show you now, right? So with that out of the way, does anybody know what the vulnerability is here? Let me open the chat. Are we required to install Burp for today's lab? Um, it would be good, but you don't need Burp for for several of the demos. So it's not uh, mandatory and definitely not during the webinar itself. So does anybody see the vulnerability here? The vulnerability is not for forwarding. Any other guesses? Rest send function. <clears throat> um, well, that is where the vulnerability is, but what is the vulnerability? Reverse shell. We can get a reverse shell with it but uh, that is not what the vulnerability is. Code injection, yes. So, so yeah, it's basically a code injection, right? We have an eval here um, on the affected code. So this is basically doing an eval of a request parameter. So uh, you can see that uh, this results in um, code execution, right? So we have a, a very small Node.js application, which is vulnerable to code injection. This is basically doing an eval of a parameter, right? So very simple vulnerability. But then the question is, okay, if we have code execution in a Node.js application, what can we really do with it, right? So we have evaluation of the queue get parameter, right? So this is request query and then dot queue. So queue is the name of the parameter that this is going to be evaluating. And then this will be returned in the HTTP response, right? So REST send is basically sending the response for uh, this uh, GET request. And then in the response, we will see the results of the eval operation, right? So with this, we can try a number of things, right? So first we, we need to do npm install express. So this will install the um, express server so that we can run the application and then you just do node uh, and then rc.js and then this will run the server uh, on port 8080. So we can then try uh, a number of things, right? So using curl, for example, we can try to multiply two by three and then we get uh, six. So this is already uh, enticing, right? Like uh, it seems we have some sort of execution on the server side because we get the result of the, of the multiplication. So this is getting executed. Another thing we can try is to uh, load different uh, Node.js modules, right? So for example, we can require the util module and then format um, a string uh, with the content hacked, right? So if uh, another thing that we can do is using a PHP like this, so we can do php-r and then echo URL encode of this, and then this will return the URL encoded payload which will be a little bit easier uh, for us to play with. And the URL encoded version looks like this. So you can also click on this uh, from the slides. And then uh, we will get the result of hello hacked, which means instead of any error message. So this means that we, we were successful to load this uh, required util module, right? So we successfully imported this library. 
So we can import other uh, modules, right? So we can uh, require the file system module and then try to read local files, for example. So we do uh, require FS for file system and then dot read file sync. So uh, reading a file synchronously, and then we are reading the contents of the Etsy password file, right? So um, now again, using curl, we can uh, URL encode uh, this payload like this. So this will result in a URL that looks like this. This is already URL encoded. And here we can see hello. And then the output of eval is going to be the contents of the Etsy password, right? So we can read local files. So these are the contents uh, of the Etsy password. What other things we can do? We can, uh, for example, create local files, right? So we can do require child process and then exec uh, touch and then create a local file on TMP like hack.txt. Uh, so uh, we can do that with curve, for example, like with a URL code trick that I showed before. So require child process exec of uh, touch and uh, temp and hack.txt. So this will create this uh, temporary file. Uh, and this is the URL encoded version. So now if you check the contents of your uh, slash TMP directory, you will see uh, hack.txt uh, being uh, saved in there. So with this, uh, we can also uh, get a reverse shell, right? So we can, for example, uh, for this part, we will need uh, to have a netcat listener in one of the terminals. So we do netcat and then NLVP. So uh, and uh, is to uh, avoid the DNS resolution, V for verbose, uh, L for listen, and P to listen on a TCP port. So we're going to listen on port 4444. And then uh, the payload that we're going to use in this case is required child process and then exec. And then we are going to create <clears throat> a temporary, uh, um, what's the name? A temporary stack uh, file on, uh, on slash temp. And then this will be used to redirect input and output. So uh, we get an interactive shell where we can see what we type, but also what comes back from the server. And we can do this without any special tools being installed on the server, right? So this can be done with a normal uh, netcat included uh, in, uh, in web servers, which is more limited, right? This doesn't have the dash E option, right? This is a netcat that is more limited, but still, we can still pull this off like this. And this is also redirecting the output, the error output into the standard output so that we see error messages as well in the terminal, right? So uh, if we send this payload, right? Again, uh, using curl, we can do curl. And then here we do php-r and then echo URL encode of uh, this payload. And then we will get hello object uh, object. But then on the terminal where we have the netcat listener, we should be able to get a reverse shell. And here we can run commands like id, ls, uh, cat etsy password, uh, and so on, right? So let me do uh, a demo about this. Let me share the VM here. So first I need to start the server, right? So you do node and then rt.js. Uh, before I forget, I'm, I will also set up the netcat listener. And now we am, I'm going to try first with the um, uh, payloads using curl, right? So I'm using curl and then doing the multiplication here. You can see I'm getting uh, the alert six, right? So uh, maybe I can make this a little bit bigger so that you can see it better. So you see two by three is, and I'm getting six. And then if I try uh, one of the other payloads, for example, um, the hacked one, right? So you can see I'm doing this uh, r echo URL encode of the payload. So this makes the payload a little bit easier to read while we can still play on the command line. And here you can see you get hello hacked, hello hacked, because uh, we are able to successfully load uh, this module. So we can now try to do um, the hacked one. So this is doing uh, executing um, hacked, and then I'm slipping two seconds, and then I'm listing the contents of hacked, and this is the current time uh, where I am. So you can see, so if I run date, 
you can see this is the current time. So you can see a new file has been created uh, on uh, slash TMP and is hack.txt, right? So this means we can run arbitrary commands and we can also create uh, files on the system, right? So now the other one that we can try is uh, reading Etsy password. Let's see. Uh, uh, okay, so this is the reading at the password, right? So here we are doing a require FS and then read file sync of Etsy password. So if I hit enter on this, we can see here that we get this hello and then these are the contents of my Etsy password file. And now we can try the reverse shell, right? So the reverse shell is uh, this one. So if I try this, you can see hello object object, but here we have uh, a reverse shell, right? So now I can do cat the password uh, and run like any command I want, right? So I received uh, a reverse shell from the server, right? So uh, now I will kill this and I will start it again. And now we can try all this also from a from a website, right? So I'm going to try this from uh, Firefox. So you can see two by three and I'm getting six. If I go, if I do require a uh, util of hacked, you can see I'm getting a hello hacked. And then if I do the, uh, the require FS and read file thing, I can see the contents of Etsy password. Uh, and this is the one for uh, creating the creating the hacked uh, file, right? So this we will have to go back to the terminal to see here if hacked. Uh, you can see well now it's just 28, but you can see that uh, this has increased to the time where I I ran that command to. Uh, 27 past one and now we will do uh, which was the other one uh, the the reverse shell right so let me check if we still have or netcat listening now we have netcat listening so if I uh, click on this and I go here you can see I also get this um, the password uh, you name this A, you know, free memory, right? So I can run like pretty much any command I want. So uh, with this, you can pretty much see what is the impact of having a code execution vulnerability in another application, right? We can load modules, we can run arbitrary commands, and that is how you would go about it um, to get the to get this working, right? So with this, let's go back to the slides. And now let's talk about another uh, case study that we have in the course, right? The Vault, uh, Vault uh, CMS Crosshair Request Forgery. Uh, and this is very interesting because it turns an XSS into remote code execution. So Vault is a, an open source uh, content management system written in PHP. Uh, and it, uh, the vulnerability that we have is uh, from an old version where a cross request forgery uh, on file uploads in Vault uh, CMS can be exploited by a normal user to upload an HTML file, which when accessed by an admin user will trigger the XSS, will trigger an XSS and we can then uh, eventually um, get a shell upload, right? So we can uh, upload uh, an arbitrary uh, PHP file, right? So before uh, proceeding uh, further, you, you are going to need for, uh, to do this exercise uh, again, from the training slides, right? So you access the training portal, download the slides, and then when you are on this slide, then you click this link, and this will download the uh, Bolt uh, CMS, uh, the vulnerable uh, version of Bolt CMS. So you can then download it and try to do uh, this exercise, right? So uh, for this, you will, you will need to install like some things, right? So you need to uh, unzip this. Uh, so if you put it on uh, var uh, www.html, you also need to give it like some, uh, um, you know, 
open kind of permissions, right? So uh, CH mod, and then if you give it recursively 777, so basically all permissions, uh, then uh, things will work uh, fine because it needs uh, right access to uh, the web route. So you're going to need to do some uh, loose permissions like this. Of course, this is not something you should do uh, in production, but uh, for the purposes of demonstrating this is something that you will need to do. Then you CD into Vault. And you will also need to uh, run these commands to uh, to get the relevant packages uh, installed, right? So you need to you need to. Then uh, you also need to enable uh, .hd access. So for that you're going to you're going to need to um, go to the Apache 2 configuration uh, and set up uh, some changes, right? So you need to replace uh, allow none, allow over, override none with uh, allow override all. And this will allow uh, .hd access, uh, which is also needed uh, by this application. So once uh, HD access support is enabled, we also need to uh, enable support for mod rewrite. So you can do that with this command. So you do sudo and then a2n mod uh, rewrite, and then you can sudo uh, service Apache to restart. Uh, and then after all this, uh, we can go to uh, the Vault CMS by creating the first user, which will be the root user um, going to a local host, Vault uh, public uh, on your browser, right? So you go to this link, and then you already have set up these two users, admin and admin123 and editor, editor123 are two users that already come with Vault um, CMS. So, uh, after all this setup, the application uh, should be working. So admin is the first user, which has all the permissions, while an editor is a normal user with uh, bare minimum permissions. So we will use the editor account to trigger a, a file upload leading to stored XSS when the admin visits the page. Uh, and then we will upload a shell, a, a shell which triggers a, a reverse shell, right? So. Now that we have successfully completed the installation of uh, Bolt CMS, let's dive into exploiting the vulnerability. So first we have a cross-site request forgery on the file upload functionality, right? So if you're logging as admin with the credentials admin and admin123, and then you click on homepage uh, in the dashboard, you can see uh, an interesting uh, file upload uh, name uh, files on the stack. So you can try to upload a file and see how the request is going to burp, right? So for this one, it's better if you have, somebody was asking before, do we have to install burp? So for this, it would be better if you use burp, um, but you can use the community edition of uh, burp just for the purposes of, uh, you know, following the exercise. Then since uh, the CMS is built on PHP, the first thing to check if is if you can try and upload a PHP file and see if we can get a direct shell, right? So if you create a file called test.php, which contains like the PHP tag and then echo one, two, three, for example, and then you close uh, PHP. So if you upload this, you will see that file type is not allowed. And then you get a list of allowed file types. Now in the allowed file types, you will see some scary ones, right? So for example, you can upload .html so with this, uh, you can, this means basically that you can upload any HTML you want, which means you have persistent XSS, right? Because you can upload a, an HTML file that contains any XSS that you want, right? So that is what we are going to uh, leverage here. So um, another thing is um, in the... Um, this error message is based on the configuration, right? So there is a backend chain for the file type and it does not allow the upload of php files directly to the server so if you explore the code base you can see uh, that the following configuration file defines which files can be uploaded so if you go to bold app and config config uh, dot yml you will see here um, how uh, this works right so if you scroll down a little bit you will see um, that there's a wide list of uh, allowed extensions being defined here, right? So accept file types, and this tells you like all the file types that are allowed, right? So if um, we uh, up, we add here um, the PHP extension using um, a cross-site request forgery, 
then we will be able to uh, upload a backdoor and then we get remote code execution uh, on the server, right? So we can find that the PHP extension is not whitelisted in accept file types for file uploads on the CMS, but this would be a target, you know, if we uh, see how the request looks like to update this configuration file uh, and we add the PHP uh, option to the accept file types, then we will be able to get remote code execution, right? So two very, very interesting things uh, to note here are that uh, HTML files are being uh, allowed to upload by default and the file uploads request does not contain any random tokens for protection against cross -R request forgery. So it is not possible for us to directly uh, upload a PHP file to the server unless we change the configuration to add the PHP extension to the configuration file. So uh, interesting uh, admin users have an option to update the configuration files via the Bolt CMS dashboard itself. So if you navigate to dashboard configuration and main configuration, then we can change the configuration. So if you edit this file and click on save to see how the request is being originated uh, to the server, you will see something like this, right? So in this case, there is a crosser request forgery token, but uh, since we can upload uh, HTML files and the file upload is vulnerable to crosser request forgery, so there's no token on that one, we will still be able to steal the crosser request forgery token through that HTML file that we will upload to then be able to modify the configuration file, right? So we can see that there's a file edit token parameter, which is also sent along with the content of file edit contents, which is the entire edited content of the config.yml uh, file. So if you send this request to verb repeater and you remove um, the file edit token parameter, you will get this error message, right? So, okay, false, uh, file config.yml could not be saved because the form wasn't valid. So uh, the server is actually checking that this cross -R request forgery token is present. So we will need to steal it with the stored XSS in the file upload, right? So the cross -R request forgery token is properly being validated by the backend. Uh, so this means that the token at Act as a sort of protection against cursor request forgery attacks and validates the form from the correct user. But since the file upload functionality does not have uh, cursor request forgery protection, and since we can upload uh, an HTML file, if we can trick the admin into visiting the uploaded page, then we can steal the cursor request forgery token with XSS and then change the configuration file to whitelist PHP files and then upload a shell. Right? So you first need to log in as admin. Uh, so you log out uh, as admin and log in as editor, uh, which is the user with the least privilege in uh, both CMS. And then you try to upload an HTML file and capture uh, this request uh, in verbs, right? So you can create an HTML file that basically has script alert one. Uh, and then uh, you can see in verb how this looks. Uh, and from the response of the upload, we can also see what the full path to um, the uploaded file is. So it will be something like this localhost, uh, bolt, public files, uh, stager.html. So uh, if you have the professional version of Burp, you can automatically generate a cross request forgery proof of concept. Um, just right click on the request and go to engagement tools. So uh, you right click on the request and then go to engagement tools and generate cross -R request forgery uh, proof of concept. Um, and this will uh, generate something like this. You can clean it up because there's a lot of stuff that is really not needed here, but uh, it's a good starting point for getting a cross -R request forgery uh, working. So you can see there's a post request to uh, vault, uh, public vault upload. And then you have the other request headers and the actual format of uh, the payload. So, and this is the rest of the stager. And here we are also uh, adding some functionality here to add the, the month and the year uh, and so on. So this will uh, return what is the path of the, of the uploaded file, right? So the above exploit uh, is a slightly uh, edited version of the auto-generated uh, 
verbs with uh, cross-site request forgery uh, proof of concept. So we can host this uh, in a server we control and delete the already uploaded uh, stager.html from the server. So then as an admin user, we can visit the hosted page and see if automatically uh, uploads a file named stager.html to our server, right? So you can click uh, on this link. So you can use that TXT um, to just download the proof of concept. And you can also uh, just uh, click on the HTML version from your browser. And this will do the cross site request forgery for you, right? So uh, this is the command to do. So you cd into var www.html and then cd into uh, bold public files. And then you can go to CD and then the year and the month and delete uh, the stager.html, right? So now from a different browser, you can log into uh, Vault CMS admin and then open a new tab and visit uh, stager.html. So you can see that an alert one is being executed, which means the stager.html uh, got uploaded, right? So then we can check um, this, if the, sa the same uh, files again, and you can see that a new file name stager HTML uh, has been uploaded. So this proves that our cross request forgery was successful. Now we can change this cross request forgery to HTML file upload to remote code execution, right? So now our idea is to make an authenticated admin user uh, upload an exploit.html file, which would contain JavaScript, which will uh, initiate a request to change the CMS configuration and add uh, PHP to the accepted file types whitelisted um, so uh, the whitelisted file upload extensions right so we want to we need to modify the cms configuration so that php files are are allowed so uh, we need to do uh, first fetch the file edit token which will legitimize the request and then we will be able to bypass the cross site request forgery check now since we upload the html file and the html file is being loaded from the same domain uh, of where the CMS is running, then this uh, access HTML that we upload is able to read the cross request forgery uh, token. And then we will be able to, um, from there, uh, upload the, uh, the PHP backdoor and get uh, code execution, right? So the exploit chain will be something like this. The admin visits an attacker URL. The admin browser uh, attempts to upload the initial HTML file, so stager.html, and then the attacker script will load the uh, uploaded HTML using an iframe and the uploaded uh, stager.html script that the following, right? So it sends a request to configuration um, to extract the request token to bypass cross site request forgery uh, protections uh, and sends the updated contents for the config.yml uh, file along with the PHP as an allowed file type and the extracted request token from the previous step. And now PHP files can be uploaded. So using the same uh, upload feature, uh, a PHP file, uh, shell will be uh, uploaded, right? So we can then trigger a reverse shell using the uploaded PHP shell back to the attacker server. So use, uh, now that our proof of concept is working, we can construct our stager.html, which contains JavaScript functions to read the cross-site request forgery token, update the configuration, and then upload the shell. So we can first write a function, which can send uh, a get request to edit the, the config.yml file and read the cross-site request forgery token from the response, right? So this is how it looks like. So we're getting a sending the request here. And then whenever the response is received, we get the response XML and we extract the cross site request forgery token from uh, the response XML, right? So, and then we get this obtained cross site request forgery token. So we save this in the console log just for debugging to see that things are working. So now that we have obtained the cross site request forgery token, we need to edit the configuration file to add PHP into the valid list of tags. So we can visit uh, this link and then try to add PHP into the whitelisted extensions, uh, ensure that intercept request is on in Burpsuit and then click on save. And then you can copy the value of uh, file edit contents and drop the request so that um, PHP is not considered uh, a whitelisted a white uh, extension yet. Um, so this is how um, this looks like. 
So we will have uh, a function here to update config with a crosshair request forgery token. So we will be calling the function here. So we have the function to read the token and then we update the configuration. This is the function to uh, update the configuration. Uh, here we would uh, replace this uh, with the token with, uh, from verb. Uh, and then uh, these, um, this is being sent, right? So uh, yeah, these are basically the steps to uh, build this, get this all working. Uh, and then we can specify the reverse shell IP, the reverse shell port, uh, and so on. So we can then uh, try to get our reverse shell uh, with this, right? So now this is the same proof of concept. We have the deconfiguration with a valid cross request forgery token. Uh, and here uh, we replace this with the configuration file. Uh, and we upload the shell. So the upload shell is basically another uh, file upload because we have changed the configuration so that PHP um, file extension uh, uploads are allowed. So now we can upload or reverse shell. And then we can put a shell one liner uh, like this, right? So we can uh, do uh, ORM and then basically it's the same uh, shell one liner as before, but with the reverse shell and the port uh, in here, right? So now all we have to do is to try this uh, and upload the stator. And then we can use Burp to generate a new cross request forgery token, which we can slightly modify to include the upload file as an iframe to the attacker domain, so that stager.html gets executed and we get a successful uh, reverse shell back, right? So for this, you need to download um, the full exploit. And this is the final exploit with all the details to get the reverse shell back uh, and everything else, right? So that is how that looks but it's basically chaining all the steps. Uh, and then we can uh, download the Vault exploit and you can extract it to a local directory. And then you can try it uh, from, uh, you need to open a new terminal and ensure that you have a netcat listener. And then from the browser, you can visit the Vault exploit.html and check that the netcat terminal for the incoming connection, right? So uh, this is uh, the case study. Uh, I think there were some uh, problems with the demo. So I will just do a part of the demo, right? But just to show you a little bit how, uh, how this is. So this is the Bolt CMS. And basically, uh, if you try to upload a, a PHP file, it will say that it's not allowed. So this is the dashboard. So you need to go first uh, to the dashboard uh, and home. I think is the, yeah, this is the files on the stack and you can see that this is the stager, right? So with the um, crosshair request uh, forgery, so I can try this crosshair request forgery uh, and this will add the stager and you can see that we get an alert one, right? So if I do F12 here, and we can see the uh, let's see the network. So I'll do it again. So you can see that this is uh, the get request to the crosshair request forgery, and then the suppose request to upload. Right. So this is the origin from where the exploit is being executed, the crosshair request forgery, and then this is doing the upload to a local host, right? Which is a different domain that 7a.es, right? So this is the actual uh, upload. So you can see here the request headers, the response headers. So uh, this is the full request. So we are uploading an HTML file that contains uh, script alert one. Uh, and uh, this is the response. So it's basically working, right? And now we have uh, here uh, in files uh, stager.html, right? So we have here the URL bold public files stager. So if I copy this, this is where the file was uploaded. So if I copy this uh, and paste it here, uh, I think 
Yes, and we get the alert one, right? So using this concept and following the other steps, um, we can then, since we are able to uh, run any HTML we want on the on the host, we can then uh, read the cursor request forgery token um, and be able to update the configuration, allow PHP files, and then upload the upload the. Um, uh, a PHP file to get code execution, right? We have, since we have a question in the chat, can we somehow perform an application level denial of service on both CMS websites? Uh, well, since you can upload arbitrary PHP files after you have code execution, you can uh, delete everything on the server or do anything else uh, you want. So yes, you can, you know, after the remote code execution, you can do a denial of service as well. Right, so if you follow the exercise and do the remote code execution, you will be able to turn this into a complete denial of service. You will be able to delete the entire servers, the, the entire server, right? Okay, so now let's move on to um, to port light pollution since we are a little bit uh, short on time. So let me try to uh, fly through this. So port light pollution attack, right? So um, here we talk about uh, Let's give you an introduction about what this is and then uh, to see this in practice, right? So this sometimes can lead to remote code execution, uh, which, uh, which is a very interesting scenario, right? So basically uh, in JavaScript, everything is an object, right? So uh, an object is a collection of key value pairs and each pair uh, has a property, right? So object is the fundamental object upon which all further objects are created, right? You can also have an empty object uh, which can be created uh, by passing null as an argument to object create. So if you do object create of null, then this will create uh, an empty object. And then a normal object uh, in JavaScript um, will create an object of a type that corresponds to its value by default and inherits all the properties of the newly created object unless it's null, right? So let's see some examples of this. If you do console log, so you can try this in your browser. If you do F12, uh, and you type this, so you can do console.log and then object uh, create null, and this will create an empty object. So you can see uh, this is completely empty and there's no properties, right? So there's no properties because the object is empty. So this happens when you create the object with this null uh, argument. So now um, the concept of function, uh, functions and classes are relative in JavaScript as functions itself uh, serve as the constructor for the classes and there are no explicit classes. So when a function is created by default, the, uh, in ja uh, the JavaScript includes a, a prototype property to the function, which is nothing but an object. So it's called a prototype object and this object is, has a constructor property, which points back to the function on which the prototype object is a property, right? So basically, if you have a function like this, function company, this name, this founder, these details, and you do com console log of company.prototype, you can see here that we have the constructor f and then constructor and then this underscore underscore proto underscore underscore. Uh, so this is basically the object, right? So the constructor points back to the function itself. If you do console log of company.prototype and company has been defined as a function, this shows the prototype of the function, right? So all the inherited uh, properties. So if you, for example, create a, a company like this, so you, you do a new company uh, of Google and then 1998, and then you do console log of company one and company one dot, uh, dot details, then this will print uh, the details of the company. And we can see uh, the structure of this and also the underscore underscore product constructor and then uh, underscore underscore product, right? So you can see that underscore underscore product points to the function dot product, right? So this is what we want to uh, attack basically. So the constructor is a magical property which returns the function that was used to create the object, right? So we have here company two, new company, uh, Amazon 1994. And then here we have company name, founder, whatever and company two dot constructor dot constructor. And this will show uh, the function, right? So constructor dot constructor points to uh, the global function constructor. So the prototype object has a constructor which points to the function itself and the constructor of the constructor 
points to the global function constructor, right? So uh, basically there's this inheritance thing going on, right? So even though prototype objects are other by default, it can also be modified at runtime. So here we modify the function prototype to add a new property. So we can uh, get similar results, right? So if you do company.tool.details, if you try this uh, on your uh, browser, again, with F12, you can try all these examples by yourself and you will uh, see this. You will get this uh, company two dot details is not uh, a function, but then if you do company one dot constructor dot prototype dot details equals uh, function the company name uh, this dot name was and then blah blah blah, and then you do company two dot details then this will work right. So you can see that a change in company one. So here we're changing the constructor of the constructor prototype of company one. This affects the company too, right? So this is very interesting because changes in the prototype uh, affect different objects in the system, right? So this can sometimes result in interesting uh, security problems, which is what we're going to see. So basically, if you have an object and the attacker can control A and C, so the attacker can control A and C here, then the attacker can set the value of A to underscore underscore proto here, and then the property B will be uh, defined for all ex existing objects of the application with the value C, right? So uh, if the attacker controls this and this, then the attacker can redefine uh, the method B for all objects in the system using the underscore underscore prototype here, right? So the attack is not exactly as simple because we need uh, these uh, three requirements. So at least uh, one of these has to happen. So we need an objective recursive merge. We need uh, a per property definition by path or an object clone, right? So we need one of these three things to happen. So this is uh, the pseudocode for a merge, right? So this is basically looping has two objects and then it uh, loops through uh, the source object and then it checks if a property exists and then it will merge and it will basically uh, try to merge all the properties so uh, the clone is complete, right? So uh, that's what that's about. So uh, to do this exercise, uh, again, while you are loaded from, while you are logged in uh, on the training portal, uh, just click on this link. So first download the slides, and then when you get to this slide, uh, click on this link, and you should be able to download this prototype pollution uh, application to test uh, and uh, verify this. So uh, while you're doing this, uh, unzip the vulnerable application. So unzip prototypepollution.zip, and then you cd into proto, which is the directory that will be created after this, and then node proto.js. Uh, in case this doesn't work, you may need to do npm install express body parser, cookie parser, uh, and path. So this will install all the dependencies for this uh, application to work, and then try node uh, proto.js again, and then you should be go to go right so um this is the analysis from the source code that you can see uh, in the application i'll show this uh, during the demo uh, and then uh, you can also try this uh, on the node.js interactive uh, command line to to understand it better right so if you run the node command and you try this uh, you will also be able to to see how this merge works uh, and all this, right? So if you paste all this in the console, you will be able to see this. So you can, for example, bar body, JSON parse of name seven is security, and then you copy body. And then when you do copy body dot name, you will see that this results in having uh, seven is security as the name, right? So we can pass the underscore underscore proto into the JSON uh, and then uh, with that, we can, uh, for example, set admin to one, right? So then every object uh, in JavaScript will have uh, admin set to one, which can sometimes uh, help you escalate privileges to admin, right? So if you do um, admin admin, uh, and then uh, the first time it's going to be undefined, and then you do bar body JSON parse of all this with admin set to one, uh, and then you do a var body of the clone. So this uh, does the copy of the underscore underscore proto, and then you do admin admin, and then this results in one, right? So basically the admin object got uh, polluted by this uh, JSON parse operation, 
due to the clone object here, right? So this was one of the requirements for the attack to work, right? So uh, with this, um, we can take this uh, in the flow. So you can tag uh, this in the source code. I'm just going to jump to the demo uh, to demonstrate. But basically, if you pass the per type uh, in the JSON request that goes to the server, we can then uh, modify the prototype for all objects loaded in JavaScript as long as there is some uh, clone uh, operation going on, right? So um, yeah, this goes into a little bit more uh, detail about this, but that is basically uh, how it works. So with this, uh, we can uh, try this in the vulnerable application, right? So we can do content type application JSON and then in the body, we can send a name 7 sec on sign up, and then we try to get the flag. And you can see that you are not authorized, and admin admin is undefined. And then if we uh, do it again, but we set admin to one, and then we try to uh, get the flag, then you can see you have successfully uh, polluted the object, right? So let's do the demo, and then this will uh, make more sense. So if I go here, and I go back to the terminal. Uh, so this is the prototype pollution, and I'm going to uh, run the server. And here we can try uh, we can try these things, right? So in this case, first I'm just sending a request of name and seven eight tech, right? So there's no prototype pollution here, and then we are making another curl, curl request to the flag, so we can see that the cookie said, but we are not authorized because uh, we have not polluted the admin object, right? But if I do move my face a little bit down, if I do, uh, if I do this, right? Let me make this a little bit bigger. So, so if now, so if I do 7 8 tech and then underscore underscore part of admin one, now we are polluting the object, right? So you can see the cookie set and then we have successfully polluted the object, right? So how is this uh, working, right? So we need to go to portal.js uh, to understand what's going on. Right? So I go to portal.js uh, and let me see here. So you can see here that before uh, admin admin was undefined, so this is why it didn't work. And then the second time when we provided the prototype, admin admin was set to one. So if we go here to the um, prototype.js, we can see that this is the merge operation where the two objects have been merged. Um, and, and this is doing the JSON parts of the request. And it's saving it to the body. Now here we have the clone operation. So this is where the problem occurs because during the clone operation, then this is polluting uh, the prototype of the object. So this is um, doing the prototype pollution on all objects in JavaScript. So even though we are working with copy body, uh, we will be um, polluting the admin object, right? So this is saying that the cookie is set, but then when you get the flag, this is basically taking if uh, admin or admin is set to one. So because admin is an object, uh, this is doing a JSON parse of the JSON certify of the cookies. Uh, and then this is taking admin one, admin, admin is one. So uh, this here we were doing the console log. So you could see that this was undefined. Um, so this was undefined first. Right, and this is why it was not authorized, and then it was set to one later, right? So when it was undefined, we were here, you are not authorized because we have not polluted this admin admin. And when we polluted the admin admin, we were here. So we had you have successfully polluted the object, right? So this is why it worked. So let's go back to the slides to wrap this up. So yeah, there's other prototype pollution uh, scenarios in the course. So with this, if there's any questions, I would also like to mention that there's a special offer uh, on the store at the moment. So if you are interested in any self-paced course, there's a 25% discount. So if you go to the store, the discount is listed in a banner there. So if somebody is interested, you can check that out. But otherwise, uh, this is the end of the webinar. So are there uh, any questions? 
Does anybody have any questions? I'm checking the chat now. Yeah, if you can type your uh, questions, no questions. Cool, so all these exercises you can try on your own, right? So from the training portal, you can download these applications and uh, try, the, uh, try them out on your own. If you have any problems, you can email at admin at 7 securitycom and we will help you out if you run into some problems or you have any questions. Awesome, yeah. Uh, there was a question uh, in the question and answer section. Sir, if we have to contact you personally, where can we contact you? Just uh, email admin at 7 securitycom uh, and then, uh, cool. Yeah, so, and then the other question was thank you, so. Okay, so all questions answered. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. And if there's no more questions, then we will uh, stop the webinar now. Thank you, everybody. And just uh, if you feel feel free to ask any questions at admin at 7 securitycom and we will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Have a nice uh, rest of your day. Um, thank you for uh, coming, everybody. Bye. So here we are ending today's session and if there is any question you can ask. Thank you Abraham for such great session and thank you all participants for your involvement and making this talk successful. Hope everyone enjoyed this session. See you in next Cyber for All webinar series. See ya.